I'd like to share before we get started that this is a regular monthly digital education series. And just as a little promotion to think ahead for our next month, our speaker series for the month of August, first Thursday of every month. So that's August 4th, starting at six o'clock Eastern time. And we will be diving in to integrative care in the world of supplements and um, uh, we'll be having our speaker, which is Dr. Singh. She is an integrative gynecologic oncologist, so she'll be talking all about supplements, uh, but most importantly in the world of cancer care, both from a safety and a best practices standpoint. So that will be taking place next month, August 4th at 6 p.m., so be on the lookout for that. Uh, anything else, Sue? No, I just love that you gave a little highlight of August because you will be on that call as well, our very own Director of Culinary and Nutrition. And just together with you and Dr. Singh, it's such a valuable topic. And yeah. um, I'm looking yeah, forward to it. There's just a lot to talk about and a lot of confusion sometimes, right? Like a lot that's, of confusion, that's, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's really, yep. really good to break it all down. So, yeah. yeah. All right, so it looks like, you know, we do always like to start on time. So Aaron, I I'll say we here. can... Yeah, stop sharing our screen. And then how about if I just get us front and center? Um, I'll spotlight myself. I'll put Aaron up there. And then of course, our speaker today, Dr. Lee. How are you, Dr. Lee? Watch your mute there. I'm good. How's everybody? Yeah, good, good. We're terrific. Well, Thank you for joining tonight. We are really honored to have you, Dr. Lee. Um, a little bit of a background on Dr. Lee. She is the Systems Chief of Radiation Oncology for Mainline Health. And she also serves as our Board of Directors Chair, and she has been serving uh, well over seven years as chair. She's going on her second term, and we are so grateful to have her. Dr. Lee graduated from Drexel University College of Medicine, where she also completed for internal medicine and internship before going on to radiation oncology residency at Fox Chase Cancer Center. She joined Bryn Mawr Hospital in 2011. I feel like I remember that actually as an attending radiation oncologist. Um, she's authored several articles for peer review journals and presented research at professional oncology meetings, many related to breast cancer, of course. Dr. Lee has been the recipient of several awards, including the Women in Excellence Award in 2006, the National Cancer Center Network Fellowship Award in 2008, and the RSNA Rogin. Am I saying that right? I, I lost it. Darn, Rodigan. No, tell me Rankin. Again. <laughs> Rankin. Oh, I think I'm, it's German. <laughs> so the worst award in 2010. Not my strength. I say that every time, not my strength. But Dr. Lee, we're going to have you take the floor. This is a very, you know, a very um, uh, serious topic. Uh, we're talking about brain metastasis tonight and really just trying to understand what is new, what is out there, and how you can answer the questions that we have in our audience this evening and from our community. So Dr. Lee, I'm going to take um, us away from the spotlight. And then everybody there, if you want to just put it on speaker view, you'll see that up in the right-hand corner. And then you'll be able to see Dr. Lee front and center um, along with her PowerPoint. And then Dr. Lee will have that slideshow come up um, in full screen and we will be ready to go. Perfect, thank you. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. Um, it's an honor to be here and uh, it's quite a heavy topic. Um, I am also a breast cancer survivor, so I certainly understand the various negative thoughts and scary ideas and worst case scenarios that come that goes through our head. Um, so it's good to hear about this topic um, that most likely won't affect most of our women. But if you uh, do have, you know, if you develop symptoms, it's good to know what they are. It's good to know what to expect for the future. Um, and uh, hopefully I can give um, uh, some hope because things have been changing a lot over the last few decades. Uh, and hopefully some advice that um, I've been coming up with over the last few years for both myself and my patients. So here we go. Um, when we talk about metastatic breast cancer to the brain, 
and we call it a brain metastasis, brain met for short. Uh, really, we're talking about breast cancer cells that originally originated from our breasts um, going into the bloodstream and ultimately traveling to the brain and getting trapped in small blood vessels in the brain that starts to grow. And when we do our imaging, we see it there. This is to separate uh, out what we call brain tumors. Um, brain tumors are tumors that originate from the brain, which behaves very, very different. Um, so this topic is really uh, about um, the probability of breast cancers going to the brain, um, how we recognize um, the signs and symptoms, the various uh, treatment options and the advancements. Um, and, then, and then hopefully what we can do to promote brain health. Um, when we look at uh, the stats on how often any person, any, any woman in, in the US that gets diagnosed with breast cancer and the probability of it eventually going to, to the brain is incredibly low, uh, mainly because we typically diagnose it in the earlier stages rather than stage four. So uh, for the most part, um, it's less than 0.5% uh, of women um, who will be uh, experiencing this. Uh, for women that are at a higher risk. Uh, in other words, um, for whatever reason, uh, their doctors felt that they needed to be treated with chemotherapy. That risk is slightly higher. It's at 2%. Um, and of course, for the women that are uh, diagnosed uh, with stage four, much more advanced stage, um, that risk is up to 10 to 15%. And then there are some nuances based on uh, your actual um, uh, phenotype with triple negative versus uh, HER2 positive. But for the most part, it's uncommon. Um, in fact, most of the brain meds that we see in, 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 um, in the cancer world comes uh, predominantly from lung cancer because to give you a, a sense, small cell lung cancer, 80 plus percent of the time it goes to the brain and we talk about treating the brain prophylactically. And then in non-small cell lung cancer, over 30 to 40% of the time it goes to the brain. So um, most of that um, and most of our literature actually is uh, from um, lung cancer as well. Um, how uh, is um, the uh, diagnosis typically made? Uh, it's usually when we are uh, suspicious of symptoms and then we quickly order a CAT scan, which could give us a sense, but ultimately um, the ideal imaging modality is with a brain MRI. Um, the brain MRIs um, cause a lot of anxiety for a lot of women because uh, it's loud, it's noisy, um, but really it's the gold standard for diagnosis. So um, many of us are more than happy if you're claustrophobic to give you um, anxiety relaxing medications to, to get through um, the MRI. Um, in terms of, I think I'm skipping a slide. Um, in terms of uh, symptoms, uh, when we when we talk when we look at most um, uh, women, especially in breast cancer, um, that have been diagnosed uh, with brain meds, uh, the number one um, symptom is actually headaches. So, so when I say that, I mean forty percent of women present with headaches. Um, it's not the run of the mill headaches. Uh, it's not, I have a headache yesterday and, and now I'm better. Oh my God, I have brain meds. It's really a chronic, progressively worse headache, uh, especially in the morning. And the headache could be so severe that it could be associated with nausea and vomiting, especially in the morning because the tumor is irritating the lining. So if the headache is not going away with a Motrin or a leave, um, or if it's not going away after a few days and you don't have a history of migraines, um, I think that's a good time to alert your physician. Uh, the second most common symptom is actually uh, a more like stroke-like uh, symptoms, uh, what we call paresthesias, which is a weakness uh, or a numbness of a particular body part. So out of nowhere, you know, you have facial numbness. Out of nowhere, you have hand weakness, hand numbness. 
um, all of those things trigger us to immediately order a brain MRI. So uh, if there, um, if you're suspecting a stroke, automatically let us know, automatically go to the ER, we will definitely do brain scans. The next common um, uh, symptom is a, um, a change in personality. And usually this is a little bit harder for patients themselves to recognize. Um, and it's a little bit easier for immediate family to see if all of a sudden you're acting a little bit odd, responding a little bit slowly, um, that is clearly different from the prior week. So I'm not really talking about chemo brain where you're like, oh, what's that word? Give me a minute. I'm kind of, I'm gonna come up with that word. It, it's not uh, mild things like that. It's more of a, a personality change. Um, um, uh, a way where, you know, you're talking to a neighbor and, and you're trying to say something and all of a sudden it's not coming out <clears throat> the words. Um, <clears throat> so that's, uh, the, um, that's the personality change uh, as well as speech changes um, and then obviously confusion. Um, and the last thing is seizure. Of course, that is, is a huge trigger for everyone to go to the ER. So um, uh, uh, we'll do an MRI and scan at um, for that as well. Um, <clears throat> so after uh, we do the MRI, if someone already has stage four um, breast cancer, we tend to not need a biopsy. But if someone has, let's say, stage one, it could still be other things. It could be a primary brain tumor. It could be something completely unrelated. And we may or may not want to do a biopsy. <clears throat> Sorry, my voice is... <clears throat> <clears throat> from a <clears throat> from a treatment standpoint, <clears throat> I hope that. Sorry, um, give me another minute. Yeah, totally. Take your time. That has so happened to me, and you just can't get it to clear quick enough. I know. Sure. <coughs> yeah, just take your time. <clears throat> I know it all too well, Doctor Lee. Aaron, when we were in Chicago, I remember thinking like when we were live, I'm like, oh, please don't, don't have that happen while oh, we're presenting live. <laughs> it happens at the worst time too. I, yeah, <laughs> we've all been there. <laughs> yeah, it is sure. what it is, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it yeah. Is. it's happened to all of us. So I'm sure my voice won't be perfect and, and just um, bear with me. Uh, so what are the different treatment options? Um, as you can see on the list, um, Three of the uh, four options involve radiation. And even the drugs is sort of the, the, when we can't do radiation anymore, then that's when we tend to do, um, um, try to be creative with some of the uh, chemotherapy drugs. Um, <clears throat> we seriously consider surgery, and this is uncommon. I would say uh, less than 10% of the time do patients end up getting surgery through their brain. Um, we tend to do surgery if there's one or two spots uh, that are particularly large, <clears throat> causing an excess amount of swelling, um, and has what is called a cystic look, in other words, fluid around it, um, and because it could lead to a pretty rapid um, decline in symptoms and neurological damage, that's when we tend to do more urgent surgery. Usually that decision is decided within a few days of someone um, going into the hospital um, and the neurosurgeons um, uh, give us a quick read on the MRI. They say either yes or no. And then within about a week or two is when the surgery happens. The surgery um, usually re re revolves around removing as much of the tumor as possible. And because it's your brain and um, every single cell uh, is important, um, they really can't do it with that wide, clear margin that you may or may not have heard about with breast surgeries. So that's why radiation goes hand in hand with the surgery. The surgery decompresses the tumor. So it allows the, the, uh, the, um, the relief of symptoms and for your function to come back faster. And then we add on the radiation to clean up that space because uh, in two huge trials um, without the radiation, there's still an over 60 to 70% chance the tumor will come right back at that space. 
So if someone were to need surgery, um, we usually think it's the best for preserving function. Um, and then they would do usually uh, up to three to five treatments of radiation afterwards. Uh, the most common scenario nowadays is, uh, is um, uh, us recommending radiation with what we call stereotactic radiosurgery, SRS for short. This is a highly intense, um, extraordinarily focused um, way to target the, the tumors within one to two millimeters of precision. Um, this is the preferred treatment because one, it's non-invasive, so you don't need to take a break from chemotherapy. It is completely painless. You lie there the way um, all the other treatments are. And each spot usually gets one treatment. So if there are three spots, we can do we can do everything within one to two days and each treatment is about half an hour. So extremely precise, uh, non-invasive, completely um, painless. And the side effects during this is nothing. And within the first year or two, um, there could be a risk of radiation irritation causing swelling. That is 1% per spot that we treat where we might need to treat someone with steroids. So besides that, there's no permanent cognitive changes. There's no surgical healing. There's no pause on chemotherapy. Um, this is hands down the preferred way to treat. And there's been many trials looking at doing um, um, serotactic radiation by itself versus doing more aggressive, whether it's with surgery or with uh, whole brain radiation. Um, and the survivals are all the same. And since this has the least amount of side effects, um, this is preferred when we can. And uh, at this point, you know, we um, when I started uh, residency um, back, uh, gosh, uh, 15 years ago, <laughs> Uh, 16 years ago, actually, um, we were doing um, this um, um, technique only for patients with one, two, or three uh, METs. At this point, um, we're doing it up to 10, and if there's a second round or a third round that needs to be done, we continue to do that to help someone preserve their function. Um, I, I met an opera singer who had over 26 lesions treated and she, uh, over a course of five years and was still performing in the opera. So, so this, I think, really shows how, you know, like even within the last 10 years, um, the data have been changing. Um, the, uh, the, the shift in medicine have been going towards much uh, more precision. We're, 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 we're doing more clinical trials on this. Um, and as a team with the medical oncologist, everyone is on board at, at, as, um, in addition to the neurosurgeons. So uh, this is the most common and what someone um, would experience. The other option, and if we need to, so let's say uh, it's more than 10. Um, let's say uh, there are small wisps where we're really worried about on a much bigger microscopic level, we're not covering everything with the spot treatment. Um, or after multiple times of doing spot treatment, um, we would consider what we call whole brain radiation. And as the name implies, really targeting the brain. So, so this has been um, the uh, default method of treatment uh, for over 50 plus years. And only in the last five to 10 years have we really figured out how to do it well, as well as how to lower some of the side effects. So whole brain radiation, um, one, it's, it's only 10 minutes, it's uh, easy, it's painless, um, you lie on your back, you know, there's a mass that gets made. Um, the, the main problem um, with whole brain radiation is uh, the, the, the memory loss that we see, and it's short-term memory loss, that gets very pronounced um, after six to nine months um, from getting uh, radiation. Um, over the last um, five to 10 years, there have been two major studies. Um, one is to really alter uh, the uh, uh, radiation technique. So instead of um, targeting the entire brain, this image shows that we're preserving uh, what is called the hippocampus, which is responsible for someone's memory. So we use um, usually nine beams all around with different angles to preserve someone's hippocampus. And this has been shown to have a dramatic improvement in memory loss. 
And the other trial that was happening um, around the same time is the use of a medication called memantine, which is uh, typically given for dementia. And the study showed that actually if you give it around the same time as um, uh, the radiation and for up to six months later, uh, there is a also preservation of memory loss. So, so now, you know, not only do we have um, more precise techniques as a default backup, uh, we have um, um, techniques to preserve someone's memory as well as a medication to prevent someone's, to preserve someone's memory. Dr. Lee, yes. uh, we did have one question in the chat relative to SRS. So Lisa just wanted to know what stage can it be used? Um, SRS, uh, we, we, Tend to, so right now we're talking about the brain. By definition, it's already a stage four. Um, I, at, I'm going to show you other scenarios where we use uh, as it's SBRT, but really it's the same thing. SRS is for the brain, SBRT is the same thing, but it's in the body. So by definition, the moment it leaves the breasts and the lymph nodes, it's considered a stage four. So if it's in the bones, lungs, liver, um, uh, adrenal glands, um, and in this case, uh, the brain. Um, in other cancers, uh, SRS, uh, SBRT, so for example, for stage one lung cancer, it's curative by itself. Um, there has been some phase one studies for stage one breast cancer. Um, one of my... Um, uh, colleagues um, um, was doing the initial phase one, which is just to see if it's safe. Uh, the initial phase one trials at the University of Maryland using a machine called the gamma pod, where for breast cancer, you uh, put in your breast, the surgeons um, would put in the clip and they did not do surgery. Um, and, and, and they would target the actual tumor using the MRI and, but this is um, really, uh, it, it's cutting edge in the sense that it's cool and neat. Even in that study, they still did surgery because we have no idea if SRS for stage one breast cancer is enough. Um, so in, in, I remember um, this is a few years ago in that study, there was um, a 60 plus percent complete response rate, which was great, uh, but it's not, 100% surgery, it's, I mean, you're taking the entire thing out. So I, I would be very cautious, uh, so shy of a clinical trial. Um, SRS is just not um, indicated for anything but stage four breast cancer. Um, Great. For, yeah, uh, for, for kidney cancers, I, I think uh, there has been also some phase two where they for people that can't do surgery for kidney cancers and small areas, it's also um, curative in I think up to 80% of the time. So it's neat, um, not, not prime time for, for early stage breast cancers. Okay, thank you for that. And, and one more question, yeah, just I love it. clarification. Is SRS the same as cyber knife radiation? No, uh, so, so uh, that is a brand of a uh, linear accelerator. So uh, we use radiation machines that are called linear accelerators. It's like you drive a car and, and you have a car. Um, uh, so CyberKnife is a brand. So if you drive a Honda or um, a Mercedes or um, a Volkswagen, so those are brands. So CyberKnife is a brand of machine that is uh, typically used for doing these precise treatments, um, except that their they're, they're most recent versions, you can treat anything. So it's really a brand of machine. Um, for the brain, um, uh, the, the most, the one that is completely geared towards the brain, the machine is called Gamma Knife. Um, there's pros and cons for, for, for gamma knife as a machine. Um, gamma, uh, gamma knife uh, uses uh, radioactive seeds. The problem with it is that it, uh, you have to use uh, screws to hold the head still 
So, so I'm giving an example of the common, the most common right here. This is the most common um, linear accelerator, um, which is uh, just uh, uh, the run of the mill. There's Varian, there's Siemens. So those are the brands for these linear accelerators. Um, and, and this is a plastic mask that is made from heating up water and then it molds over your face and you can see you can see you can breathe um and and your arm and everything is loose this is to hold your head very very still and there's like a cushion down here and it's a clam mask um to use a uh, gamma knife for a brain um, instead of a clam um, mask they, they use screws. Uh, some are hard plastic uh, um, and other ones use metal screws. So uh, I, I was doing some of that um, when I was at Fox Chase uh, where you would need the neurosurgeon and then you would get these four points um, and then your head um, goes into the machine. Um, it's incredibly good for other brain tumors that are more benign. So, so, these, so again, we're um, in cases where let's say someone has a, a meningioma or um, an acoustic neuroma, um, the, that, that screwing of the head sounds awful, but it gives you so much precision um, that for someone who is just getting the treatment for, for control, but not dealing with a stage four cancer, um, that makes sense. Um, yeah, so in terms of the brands, there is CyberKnife, there is um, Gamma Knife. Um, we have uh, a also a, um, um, a sterile tactic radio surgery configured machine um, called uh, Varian Edge, um, and then uh, we have um, in, in the other centers we have um, a, uh, a trilogy. Um, so so these are just sort of like. You know, do you drive a Honda Accord or do you drive a Honda Civic? Um, they're they're more they're, they're more names than anything else because the the way it works is all very similar, um, highly targeted, precise uh, radiation, um, and 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 all of those machines. Um, there are pros and cons um, to each of them in terms of how you use it. Great, thank you. Um. Drugs. So uh, the biggest um, uh, barrier um, to using drugs as the primary way of treating brain meds is that most drugs are uh, physically too big to cross the blood brain barrier. So your brain has a natural protective mechanism that separates itself uh, from the bloodstream. Um, um, to, to preserve uh, the function. And since it controls everything, it, it spends, um, we have adapted a way of uh, protecting ourselves against chemicals and drugs. And in this case, most of the chemotherapies don't cross over very well. Um, and, and even though it doesn't cross over very well, it still can. So um, in a non-HER2 positive patients, if we can't do uh, radiation anymore, um, these drugs um, have been shown to have uh, uh, efficacy in crossing and having some effect in controlling um, 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 brain meds. Um, recently, uh, just two years ago, um, in patients with HER2 positive uh, brain meds, um, there was a trial called HER2 CLIMB where when you added um, this drug, um, to catintinib, if I could say it properly, um, it uh, actually improves um, survival. So this is probably the only combination where you can consider and only if you have HER2 positive breast cancer um, to, to consider first um, before uh, doing radiation. Otherwise, pretty much surgery and radiation is the uh, first mode of treatment. Um, having said all of that, you know, when we look at the probability of someone developing brain meds uh, from uh, when they're diagnosed with stage four, over the last 10 years, it's actually been declining, declining uh, a little bit with time, especially in HER2 positive tumors. So that 
even as I'm saying what I'm saying, the reality is that most of these drugs actually do uh, cross a little bit. And at some point, the, the, the tumor is able to escape its control. So, you, you know, I think the, the survivals are improving because uh, the drugs are more effective. Um, the drugs do cross over a little bit. So we see a little bit lower rates of brain meds from breast cancer. Um, and uh, now we have a study to show that actually one of the drugs works. So since that kind of opens up um, at this new um, doorway for pharma, uh, I suspect that in the next 10 years, there will be a, another wave of drugs that will be useful for treating um, brain meds. Um, so, you know, in terms of prognosis, um, I, I think that's always in someone's mind, like, you know, you run through these worst case scenarios, like, okay, I'm going to develop meds, okay, I'm going to develop brain meds, how, like, if I do, oh my gosh, uh, how much longer do I have to live? Um, so it, you know, 20 plus years ago, we would say four to six months with um, a little bit of steroids and with whole brain radiation. And as you heard me say that we almost don't do that up front anymore. At this point, um, depending on which subtype, on average is well over a year is the average lifespan for someone who've had brain met. And in many, it's over two years. Um, I just had my physicist pull my data for uh, women that were treated um, from 2020 and 2021. I didn't want to include this year because it's too recent. 42% um, of them are still alive. Um, I had a patient that uh, lived for over 15 years from the day of her um, um, brain met treatment with SRS. And ultimately she died from an infection, which is awful, but sh her brain was clear. And, um, um, and mo for the most part, her tumors were still well under control. Um, so I, it's definitely not the immediate death sentence that everyone thinks about. And as I was alluding to, you know, uh, really just from, from a big picture standpoint, um, breast cancer survival has been improving year after year after year. Uh, you can see that even from the 90s, um, this is anyone um, with stage four cancer that is under the age of 50. And, and it's focused on younger patients because actually younger patients have uh, some of the, the lower survivals because the tumors are just more aggressive. Um, and, and it's doubled uh, in um, even 10 years ago. And I don't have a great slide for, for 2022, but it's definitely over 40 plus percent. And this is a, another um, great slide of how from like, these are five year increments of stage four breast cancer um, and the survivals that have been continuously improving. And this, you know, stops at 2012, but as of now, it's, it's all the way up to here, over 40%. And we make, you know, all these, uh, Sue and I talk about this um, after um, um, ASCO, which is the main uh, medical oncology um, conference. Um, it, it, when, when we hear uh, and when we look at these trials that say we have um, another six months improvement in survival, we have another four month improvement in survival, it mentally sounds very little. Um, but between all of the different drugs and all of the different slight improvements in both modality, as well as us learning how to give supportive medication to decrease side effects, this is how we gain our survival with small increments at a time. There, there's, there, there's no magic drug that just kind of clears up the body, but with small increments. Um, um, improvements with time with each of these drugs, each of the studies, um, uh, ra various radiation techniques, the survival has, re has really been pretty dramatic. I mean, doubling over the last 20 years. Um, I pulled this uh, from the um, FDA uh, website. Um, so this is the current uh, FDA approved uh, breast cancer specific drugs. There's over 70 of them. And probably uh, over the last 10 years, 
um, is when we approved about one third to half of them. So for a long time, you know, the cancer cancer um, drug approvals have been fairly slow because we weren't finding and we weren't hitting the right the right the right drugs. I mean, uh, like over the last ten years, it's it's, it's been um, a very steep increase in in um, pharma's ability to find drugs that work. Um, so, uh, you know, earlier when someone was asking about like SRS, what else is SRS uh, used for? Basically anything that is small. Um, so that, so, so uh, we've done it for bones, for spine meds, um, for, for lung, lung meds, um, certainly um, in the liver, we've done plenty of liver, we've done plenty of lymph nodes. And these are very quick, um, by definition, um, SRS, SBRT is less than five treatments, um, highly precise, high, high, high amounts of uh, radiation, typically 80 to 90 plus percent effective at controlling each spot that we're targeting with essentially no side effects. Um, you know, I, I can say that I've probably treated over 150, 200 spots um, over the last few years. Uh, I mean, you know, one person had nine rounds and had a little bit of nausea and fatigue. And that's really about it. Besides that, I can't think of the last person um, that actually had side effects um, from spot treating in the body. Uh, the brain um, is a little bit different depending on some of the drugs. I was saying earlier that there's about a 1% risk per spot of swelling that we need to treat. And that's usually the most common side effect. Um, so this is uh, a radiation trial that I wanted to point out because you know, for, for a long time, we know that spot treating is easy, it's simple, it improves people's quality of life. Um, I'm pulling up this trial because this is the first trial that actually shows if you have five or less uh, spots at diagnosis, at metastatic diagnosis, um, and we treated all those five spots with radiation, the survival is double at five and six years. These, these Many of these women um, are considered cured. So, so I, I think, um, you know, uh, SRS, SBRT has a huge role in the future in treating and improving the survival of stage four patients. Um, so uh, the first, this is my summary of the first portion. Um, uh, brain meds in general um, from all comers and all breast cancer diagnoses are uncommon, less than 1%. And even in some more advanced uh, stages where um, you need chemo, it's 2%. Um, and uh, the symptoms that we typically have, um, headaches, numbness, uh, change in personality, um, or the way you behave, um, that's when you would call your doctor. The treatments, um, for the most part, involve some version of radiation, whether it's surgery followed by radiation or radiation by itself, typically with spot treating with SRS. Um, and then there um, uh, will be a lot more advancements in the drugs, um, usually as backup or in conjunction with radiation. And really the survivals have been improving um, generally for stage four patients, as well as um, for uh, women with brain meds. Um, why don't I pause here for some questions first? Dr. Thank Lee, we had, we had a few. Yeah, thank you, Sue, go ahead. Well, I have one that ended up coming to me direct, so you might not have seen it, Erin. Um, if someone has stage four, HER2 positive, and brain meds is medication that crosses brain barrier recommended before radiation. If someone has stage four, HER2 positive, and brain meds is medication that crosses brain barrier recommended before radiation. Yeah. So, um... The HER2 CLIMB trial, um, it, so this is her, specifically HER2. The HER2 CLIMB trial uh, basically uh, did not um, involve any radiation. And then the patients, uh, uh, the ones that got um, the uh, tucatinib um, live longer um, and had a longer chance of controlling the brain med. 
So realistically, uh, what we do is when someone comes in and if there's one, two, three, four or five, you heard me say the radiation could be done within two, three days. Um, it's quicker to do the radiation and spot treat those areas than to get the insurance approval. If there's a hesitation to do the radiation for whatever reason, um, let's say it's more spots, let's say we someone is recommending whole brain and, and you really don't want whole brain because um, it does cause a lot of fatigue and, and there's that risk of um, short-term memory decline, um, then certainly um, um, take uh, beyond this medication. Now, all of this happens um, uh, not in silo because usually women with stage four uh, HER2 positive breast cancers are getting um, um, continuous HER2 blockade with Herceptin, with Progetta, with these newer, uh, you know, TDM1, TDDX um, uh, drugs. Um, so it's never it's never really in silo. And then at the same time, you know, for if you're HER2 positive and you're estrogen positive, you're also on an estrogen blockade drug. Um, so I would say whether it's uh, before or after, it, it probably doesn't matter. You know, after a blade of radiation, um, the radiation certainly uh, disrupts uh, the blood-brain barrier in that area and it allows um, the drugs to penetrate a little bit better. Um, but is it more helpful to do it? Uh, so logically, if I were to do a, an experiment uh, and your goal is to get um, more penetration, I would say that you would do the radiation first and that would help you with the penetration. Um, I don't know if that answered that question. Uh, yeah, no, I think that's good. Erin, I see one here from Ellen. Should I do that one? Um, well, it was not a question. She actually said that she had five brain meds treated with SRS last month and all this information gives her hope. So thank you, Dr. Lee, for bringing all this in such a, a way that we can all digest. Thank um, you, Ellen, for sharing that. Yeah. yeah. And then Lisa was saying, could you speak to the difference between the rate of METs for H HER2 positive versus say triple negative, is it greater? Yeah. So. Um, um, of met for the brain or in general metastatic rates? Um, so um, she didn't say, that's Lisa. Could you speak to the difference between rate of met for yeah. her two positive She's versus triple negative brain? Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. She's a brain. Um, so I think it, uh, for the most part, um, because we're comparing, you know, like, who has it worse, if you're triple negative or if you're HER2 positive, it just kind of all sucks in general, right? Um, uh, the brain met rates, if you are diagnosed with stage four and is HER2 positive versus stage four, triple negative, there's probably a higher chance of the stage four HER2 positive having brain mets. It's uh, in some of the studies, it's 30 plus percent. Um, it's pretty high in other studies is as high as 50% for HER2. For triple negative stage four patients, and I just want to be very clear because this none of this applies to stage one. Uh, for stage four triple negative patients, um, it's up to 20 to 35% um, risk of going to the to the brain at some point in your lifespan. Um, Having said that, um, the survivals are not necessarily worse for HER2 positive patients. In fact, one of the longest survivals that I've been seeing it, with brain meds um, in my literature review is actually in HER2 positive patients, because as I was alluding to earlier, um, actually all, a lot of the HER2 positive uh, drugs um, somehow are preventing and crossing, and then there's now an FDA approved drug specifically for HER2 positive. Um, in general, that's been our challenge with triple negative tumors, um, finding drugs that work well. Um, we've been incredibly successful um, uh, in the HER2 positive population um, since the discovery of Herceptin. We've, we've been incredibly successful. 
um, and we're still working on that uh, for triple negative. Um, you know, the immunotherapies have been very effective for triple negative. Um, we've been adding um, different agents um, for our triple negative patients. Um, so, so yeah, uh, comparing two things that um, are 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 just different. Thank you. Erin, did you see Nancy's question there? Do you want to take that one? Yeah, that's a great question. So she's asking if you can address neoadjuvant radiation treatment immediately before versus after brain surgery for larger brain mats. She had this treatment. Yeah. Um, so the biggest benefit with, um, with surgery is that it really, um, and as I was alluding to, and I didn't want to get into some of the nuances of the clinical trials, um, it really uh, preserves someone's function. So that when, so, when, when there's a large area, it's, it's big or it's filled with fluid. And when it's, um, if we do radiation before to do the cleanup prior to having the surgery, um, the surgery is, smaller um, and it uh, allows uh, the surgeons to clean up better and, and cut out a smaller area. Um, in most of the cases, it actually makes the radiation target uh, smaller as well because we can clearly see the edges of the tumors. Um, after surgery, what we get is the post-operative bed. And after uh, what we, have to do is 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 track and trace where there could be um where the surgeon could have been um so so what we see is you know like uh we, typically they they remove a piece of bone and that piece of bone is of course it's not that small because they need to get their instruments in so that piece of bone region the entire region gets covered even if the tumor is much deeper so so the benefit to doing a neoadjuvant um uh, radiation is that one, it's a smaller area of treatment. Two, it shrinks the tumor so that um, the surgeons um, um, don't have to dig as much. Um, you could also uh, arguably use a lower radiation dose um, so that it doesn't cause swelling and, and has less of an impact. Um, I've definitely um, uh, seen this done um, as well. Did that answer your question? Was that, I hope that was similar to what uh, they were explaining. Yeah. Great, thank you, Dr. Lee. All right. Um, you know, uh, so for, for patients that have never been, you know, on the phone call, there's uh, on, on this Zoom, there's clearly a few patients that have had brain meds. And then I know there's um, a number that have never, that, that are still um, um, early stages and are just joining um, for information. I think regardless, it's nice to be able to do something. Um, I, I took this quote from uh, Victor uh, Franco, who is, uh, who, who is a, a neurologist as well as psychiatrist and was imprisoned um, in um, uh, one of the uh, concentration camps. Um, and he uh, saw how the inmates, how, how, how the Jews that were in prison um, psychologically were behaving how he was doing himself mentally, as well as um, the, uh, pr the, the, the prison guards. Um, and he wrote extensively um, about the human condition and when we're trapped. I mean, it doesn't get any more hopeless than not knowing which you're, you're in prison, then you could die any day and you could be. So, um, you know, he, he found that really when we can't change a situation, in the end, all we have is ourselves to change. And the only thing you could change when you can't move, you can't leave, you can't even sing, is to change your attitude and your perspective. So um, in general, even for people that have had treatment, 
and of course for I uh, not necessarily to prevent, but it's good to have a healthier brain. So um, after all of the treatments that we've had, whether it's uh, your chemo brain or the estrogen blockers that you've had. So what are the things that we say? It's the same thing for um, cardiovascular health. It's the same thing for stroke health. We eat well, and this is why we're part of Unite for Her. We sleep well. Um, um, we have a regular schedule and that helps us sleep. Um, eating and exercising helps us sleep. Exercising is good for the brain. Um, if you can't do cardiovascular work uh, because of joints, aches, get into a pool. If you don't have access to a pool, go walk. If you can't go out to, to walk, do, do leg lifts and just move your arms. Um, being active is going to help you sleep. It's going to be good for your brain. It's going to get blood flow going to the brain um, better and healing better. Um, so all, actually all of these things, maybe less so in terms of studies with eat and sleep, certainly with exercise and meditation, there's been numerous actually MRI studies um, looking at how our brain improves, especially in the centers that causes depression, in the centers of hopelessness, in the centers um, of memory. Um, there is improvement in um, the, uh, the, the memory centers, improvement in um, the happiness centers when we meditate and when we exercise seen in functional MRI. And I, I thought that's pretty, pretty, pretty neat. It's almost like a no brainer. It's like, of course, if we want our brain to be healthy, whether it's to uh, get better from all of our treatments that we've had for um, um, whether it's brain or just chemo or, or the estrogen blockers, like, of course, that's what we're going to do. What else can you do? Um, so many studies have said if you learn a new skill, a new neurons actually form. So play some games that you've never played, learn to paint, learn a language, learn, learn um, a music instrument, learn how to crochet. Um, you know, New York Times has a lot of um, fun puzzles to do. Uh, and and learning means learning. So I know some people are experts at crossword puzzle. It doesn't mean doing more crossword puzzles. It means doing the math works. People that are great at math, you should probably cross over to do some uh, word puzzles instead. Um, so do something new and different. <clears throat> um, I, I, I think what is understated is how big of an impact our community um, has on us. Um, whether it's Unite for Her, the people that we can actually have shared experiences with, whether it's our family um, um, or uh, our friends. So, you know, make a bucket list if you don't have one. Uh, we don't have to have stage four to, to make a bucket list. And certainly if you do, to focus on what's actually meaningful in your life. Because the reality is that you know, we, I, I just had another patient who had an infection and passed away, completely not related to, to um, their cancer diagnosis. Um, or somebody else, you know, who, who had a major fall and was hospitalized. These things we cannot control. And if we, no matter, no matter what our, our life you know, on this earth is finite, um, whether it's one year, two year, 10 years, and if we don't find meaning now, um, after having um, seeing um, a more finite time in, in our lifespan, when else are we going to do it? Um, you know, when you look at a lot of these uh, books on um, uh, what people regret when at their deathbed, it, it's not working harder. Um, it's not making more money. Um, it's not. It's usually not spending more time with their friends and family. It's usually wishing that they had worked less because they didn't love their work. They work to make money. Um, and no matter how long our lifespan is, finding, finding meaning um, is really critical. So uh, yeah, that's it. Um, thank you for listening. Um, this is my uh, one of my teams. I have three teams. This is one of my teams at Riddle and our linear accelerator. Um, all of us love what we do. Um, I mean, we all want to be kind uh, and considerate. 
Um, we know what it means to have cancer. Most of us have either had family members or ourselves um, that were that that have gone through this. So uh, thank you for listening. Oh, thank you, Dr. Lee. You're getting uh, so much support in the chat. If you get a chance to read through there, they really just appreciated your words and your wisdom and your help and educating them through this because um, such difficult topics and you really made an incredible presentation for us tonight. So thank you. We yeah. could take, um, we have another five minutes if you don't mind hanging on with us, Dr. Lee. And we could take a couple more questions if we see them come up. Erin, did you see any come up at all that we might've missed? Well, there was a question earlier in the chat that just talked about the timing in terms of cancer death after radiation is complete. So is it something that happens instantaneously? Is it, are we not sure? What does that time frame look like, Dr. Lee? Let me see if I can find the actual question. It's a little earlier on, um, and, and forgive me if I'm saying the first name correctly, it was a question that came from Sadia. Sadia. Mm -hmm. How long it usually takes to kill all cancer cells afterwards, okay. which, I, which I thought was a good question in terms of timing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I had all these uh, uh, slides on um, and then I deleted it. Um, so uh, following someone who have been treated is very tricky. Um, and actually, my, my slide shows uh, the tumor uh, because the treatment is, is, is once. That tumor gets treated usually uh, once, no more than twice, right? Um, and then three months later, we do an MRI. Uh, at that next MRI, it might look about the same or it might look a little bit puffier. And then the next MRI easily could shrink. And then the next, and these are three month increments of MRIs. And, and once someone has been diagnosed with brain meds, it's MRIs for life. Um, and then at the next MRI, um, there could be an irritation looking um, region from the radiation that is fairly common, especially with the newer, newer drugs um, that patients are on. Um, at this point, sometimes up to 20%, but only one to 2% is highly symptomatic where we need to, to do treatment. So then you have this like fuzzy, you know, it's like something that's like this, um, the next MRI is a little bit bigger, the next MRI is smaller, and then it has this like weird look to it where it looks like it's just irritation from the radiation. And then at the next MRI, it could look a little bit more swollen and then we give them steroids. And then the next MRI, it disappears. Um, so uh, to answer like how long are all of the tumor cells killed is probably sometime between a week to three months. Um, and then everything else we see after that are these delayed either scars or um, um, uh, uh, radiation reactions. So, and you know, it varies from tumor to tumor. Um, the bigger it is, uh, the more delayed it is, the smaller it is, the more it's likely to fully disappear. Uh, the small tumors that are under about a centimeter, a centimeter and a half, I would say that especially like the five millimeter ones, by the first MRI, it's completely gone. And since we're not doing MRI between day one, day zero and, and, and three months, um, is it one month, is it two months? Um, but they tend to be completely gone. I mean, it's um, what we know is that the, the control rate at one year is over 92% for anything less than two centimeters. Um, and then um, for over two centimeters, it's about 88% control rate. Um, and then at two years, it drops by about uh, 5%. So it drops to like, like 88 and then, and then 80. So, so the full kill is, is pretty effective anywhere within the first few months and certainly within the first two MRIs. Wow, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Erin, for digging that question back up for us. Oh, there's one. Um, I have after three and a half years in remission of stage one and radiation tamoxifen in 2002, I had two brain surgeries because of a large tumor. Is that rare? You know, um, this is what's really sucky about breast cancer, right? Like we could say to someone, listen, you have a 99% chance of cure, 
which is great. And you're like, yes, what, ha- what if you're that 1%? You, you never know until you know. Um, so, so is it rare? Yes. Does it happen? Yes. Like every conceivable bad thing can happen. Is it common? No. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, I hope you find something meaningful to do today um, and to certainly think about how you spend your time. Um, I appreciate you inviting me to do this talk and uh, yeah, spending your hour with me. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee. It was so informative. Our community appreciated it and um, we appreciate you. And that's how Unite for Her is able to just be this great you know, resource for so many women in our community that we serve because our board, our advisors, um, they're so committed to the work that we have. And, and we 